nearby. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Brent Smith. That is an African elephant and I have Dave on camera with me today. Scott, Steph and uh, Viema out on bushwalk and we are going to try find these lions that completely befuddled me this morning. But as you can see, there's quite a few different breeding herds. Those have been watching the Juma cam uh, moving around. So that makes tracking lions a little bit more tricky, having to duck and dive between the ellies. So the last tracks drop into the Moati River system. And I can't seem to find any coming out, which leads me to believe, are oh, they possibly not still in the Moati River system? So we're going to check down, about, and around. And I'm sure lots of these ellies are around, so we will pop back with them a little later. And I think before it gets too cool in that elephant's Oh, sorry, the lions start maneuvering. Uh, let's get going and see what's out there. Okay. Great way to start. A nice heavy. So I think the lions are lying up somewhere in these drainage systems here. I'm hopefully, hoping we're going to be able to find them. So I went and had a look where James and Steph saw the tracks this morning where they crossed into the Moai. Could they just be lying under a jackalberry, enjoying digesting that buffalo of two nights ago? I'm just going to look very carefully here quickly for tracks. This is a good spot that they might have come out from, but nothing so far. Scotty's definitely going to be out tracking. Hopefully, we do manage to find one of the big cats today. It does feel like I've had a little bit of a leopard drop, so I'm hoping to rectify that. And don't forget, if you're wondering anything about the bush, or about the animals, or even about the Safari Live crew, drop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv use the hashtag safari live on twitter elephants have been rearranging the roads again we're not a lion track in sight so down towards the Moati River. So even though it looks cloudy and overcast, it is still 30 degrees Celsius, 86 Fahrenheit. But it is quite nice to have a little respite from the sun. day like this today with that nice overcast area. Those lions might have moved during the day, so always important to just double, triple check for tracks. We covered this area quite extensively on the sunrise safari. You never know. So 
what we're looking for when we look for lions, and especially on a day like today, or especially if they're, they're quite fat, is that white belly. That's sort of the real sort of standout point. Occasionally you might see an air flick or a tail flick, but that white belly is the, the standout point that's hopefully going to lead us to the lions. continue to check. Uh, let's go see how Scotty's getting along on foot. Hello everyone and welcome to the Bushwalk. It's a great pleasure to have you with me. My name's Scott if you haven't joined us before and I'm teamed up with Vim who's on camera. Now he's not only holding a camera for a moment there with one hand as he gave you a thumbs up but he's also wearing a massive backpack with a long antenna pole sticking out of it. So it's going to make moving through this thick bush quite difficult but there's a good reason why we've decided to come here and that is that Karula, a female leopard, had made a kill of a diker here yesterday afternoon. We heard the diker squealing. It could have been a steenbuck, but I think it was a diker squealing in distress. And at the same point in time, we got a call over the radio that a cheetah had been seen. So we went racing back in the opposite direction. Sadly, we didn't find the cheetah. We were also in a vehicle and it's impossible to get into this bush in a vehicle. It's simply too thick. So we should just come to investigate on foot. We're gonna be moving very slowly. Uh, not only the fact that we're looking for a leopard that could still well be here, there's other animals like buffalo and elephant that are exceptionally dangerous so we're going to be testing the wind as we go for now it's in our favor as you can see it was blowing directly past the camera there so let's go I do fear that this may be a low signal area um, but stay with us for as long as possible and if we do get lucky enough to find her then we'll be able to maybe try and spy on her from some high ground where we do actually have signal. Vim you're gonna have some tough work getting through here but let's see what happens We've also got to help extra eyes, extra and extra hours and experience on foot. So he's also keeping a BDI out for any potential threats. I think there's a good opening through here that we should be able to wiggle down into this riverbed. And isn't it wonderful that now we get to take you into places that ordinarily we would not be able to take you in the vehicle, but as you guys see it's breaking up a little bit so give us some time to continue it shouldn't take us too long to work this area hopefully we'll have some good news if not we'll move out a good prospect of us trying to track down some if we don't have any luck with the leopard initially so we'll keep you updated but for now back to brent so Hopefully Scott is on tracks of something and he'll be able to find it shortly. I've just looped around this block and I have found the Inkahuma Pride in here before on quite a few occasions actually, last week being one. He ducked into the Mawati and came up and ended up lying just up the road there, but no such luck this morning, or this evening, sorry, morning for you guys in the States. During the day on the Juma camp, on the Juma camp, uh, an elephant with very strange, incredibly long toenails popped out. And James Taylor has managed to grab a screenshot of it and he shared it. And we were actually looking at it, uh, Nikki and Scott happened to be in final control when that elephant arrived. And it, uh, we were actually chatting about it uh, over lunch. And I'm not sure why. I don't know, maybe if it's doesn't utilize those back toenails as much, doesn't seem to kick them, or maybe there is a bit of a defect, a, a birth defect, or even a, a defect from an injury, but unlikely to be an injury with on both feet. So we have reached a little river system that runs through the heart of Juma, the Mawati. It's one of the hardest ones to get on camera. Okay, you see him going there? Go in between the trees. Okay, to the right. So come out of it. See where the stump is? Okay, there. Zoom in. 
if you come out, well, you got to watch my fingers. There. 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 And a little stand of mongoose. And he's about the other side, I think. Oh, oh, he's a, he looks like he's hunting that Franklin. And Franklin. Oh, no, there he goes. Are you stopping and looking at us? Disappearing. Down to the left. There's his tail. You just see the little black tip to the tail. Uh, it might pop out the other side. And this is one of the harder animals to get on the live drive. So I think if we've got some new viewers, it's worth attempting to try catch the little guy. to go and I'll look for the largest of the carnivores. That's one of the smaller ones. And I'm just going to have a quick look in the Mwati River Basin to see if those lions are possibly chilling in the sand down here. Of course, we can't go too far due to some fallen trees. But we're having a look. wondering, did anyone find out which lions were at Sydney's dam? I'm afraid I didn't, Lynn. I'm not sure which lions were there. says last night they viewed a cat-like animal with long tufts of the ears. Now I can only think of one animal that comes to mind immediately that has long tuft ears and is cat-like and that is a caracal. Uh, which camera was it? Craft book, uh, let us know. That will also help us in figuring out what it is. But if it was a caracal... Sorry about 
office, guys. Give me one second. There you go. Was it like that? That bottom picture there? That is a caracal. And that is the only bird, I mean, sorry, I just saw a bird fly off there. The only cat that has those long tufted ears like a lynx. Probably about this tall. Have a look out. So probably standing about that high off the ground. Very stocky, very squat, well built. So what we do between the sunrise and sunset tries. Well, Cheryl, that's a secret, super secret spy business. Can't be telling you any of that. All right, I know you're joking, Cheryl. Um, we'll catch up on our admin. And unfortunately, we do have such a terrible thing as admin, uh, emails and whatnot. Uh, sometimes a snooze, sometimes read a bit, have a swim. tracks here. As I said, it could be quite possible that on the other side of this tree fall, I'm going to have to go around again and keep looking. So that's the end of that road. I'm going to have to do a U-turn. constantly around this block we've checked now we've now eliminated the whole northern uh, and some of the southern sections and the, and the east as well and the lines haven't come out so that only leaves west and if they haven't come out of the, the west then they're still in there and i might take a little walk into the drainage line a little bit later She just, she went on a safari in the Sabi Sands to Elephant Plains in October. And she said while chatting to the guides, she wanted to know their opinion. If she looked into a lion's eyes, uh, would it look straight back at you? Kathy, now this is a, something that will differ between a lot of guides. I personally believe they don't see you as a human. They don't see that bipedal figure on the vehicle. Uh, and the way their eyes work, they don't see the same detail we see. So I do not think they see you as a separate entity when you're sitting on a safari vehicle. When you're on foot, yes, they see you, but they're recognizing your shape. They're not looking into your eyes. So I would tend to agree with them uh, that I don't think they see individuals on the vehicle. They will pick up movement, little bits of movement and stuff like that, and it often feels. And especially with the big cats, they give you that thousand yard stare and it seems to go straight to your soul. But 
I don't personally believe they're seeing you as individuals. Uh, some other people might disagree, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's pretty safe to say that they don't. So Scott, he's out of uh, the little river system, so he's on higher ground, so his picture should be good. Uh, let's go see what he's been up to. So we are currently just up on the eastern bank of that riverbed that you saw us heading down into. And as Brent says, good news, we found tracks of the Inkahuma Pride, but sadly, they are heading north directly to our northern boundary. We're not too far away, but anything could have happened from the last tracks that Vim and myself saw and uh, where, we, you know, where the lions have ended up. Maybe they've made a buffalo kill just around the corner. Anything is possible. The good news on top of everything is that Steph is just down in the riverbed walking adjacent to us. Um, he can stay on the trail because he doesn't need signal. And we're in close enough comms that we can just keep whistling to one another. <laughs> And then he gives me a call back. Sadly, you won't be able to hear that. Um, but that's how we communicate whilst walking through the bush. And quite often with trackers and guides, while they go out tracking, you don't stay together. You kind of split up and find common area, crisscrossing that way, fit more effectively staying on the trail of animals. So we are simulating that right now. We are on a wonderful game path at the moment. VM said there's... <laughs> not enough traffic or signs of traffic of the animals we're looking for uh, i.e. the lions and the leopard but there has been quite a lot of elephant sign this isn't fresh but it does go to show that elephants have walked along this pathway this is some of their dung that's interestingly been ruffled up by a number of different uh, animals, mainly insects, initially dung beetles will rummage through elephant dung, as will franklins and other birds. As you can see, the elephants have got a poor digestive system. I mean, there's chunks of bark here, hardly even digested. And that's why it's so important that there are all these other animals in the ecosystem, not only the big ones that cause, uh, you know, all of this waste, but the smaller animals that break it down and recycle it back into the ecosystem. Mm. Very nice earthy smell, nothing poopy, obviously a fresh elephant dropping, I wouldn't suggest doing the same thing, but this has got a wonderful smell, almost kind of like that of walking into a thatch house, I'm not sure if any of you uh, live in areas with thatch housing or grass roofing, you know, but I always love the smell of that. Just going to open up the way here for VM and his antenna. Hello Anne, and you would like to know if the rivers that flow through Juma and Arethusa will ever flow, and yes they will, never for sustained periods of time, they kind of just fill up when there's been heavy rainfall, um, but, but, but because we are in a drought, uh, the, that's the reason why we're never seeing them flowing, we're not getting nearly as much rain as we normally get, so I guess that's that, but on top of that we do need to, to remember that around the world and many wilderness uh, areas sadly the wilderness area is affected and impacted by the surrounding populations farms dams that are built by humans therefore intercepting water that may originally flow into a wilderness area so even though the area may be completely pristine as it was hundreds and thousands of years ago the surrounding areas sadly are having huge impacts on those little pockets of pristine wilderness i've spotted something quite interesting here that i'd like to show you Steph's just talking to me. I wish you could hear him. He's got ahead of us and we're a bit further back and his hearing's much better than mine so I'm sure you would have heard my response and at least now he just knows where we are. Now what I've spotted is maybe VM can come and stand here and I'll jump across this little gully is this most beautiful egg case. Take a look at this. It's got like a almost spray painted look to it shiny silvery coloration that would be far better seen in sunlight as opposed to this overcast light you also see all these little kind of holes in it and this is the cocoon of a lunar moth 
a beautiful, beautiful moth. Oh, look at the ant by my baby finger here. Let me try and pull it up into frame here. Awesome. So we know that this is the lunar moth. They've got a very specific cocoon. And sadly, we haven't been able to show you any this season. But what I will be able to do quickly is get it out of my, my insect book. So let me leave this behind. This is a tambour tea tree, and that's why I know the, the type of cocoon plus the type of tree that it's in, the tamboti tree, indicates to me that this is the lunar moth. This is the main tree that they will lay their, or, or rather cocoon in. So, this shouldn't take me too long. I got lucky, I got straight onto the moths. Here we go. The green one, just above my forefinger. That was who was responsible for that. And imagine if we get lucky enough to find you one of those. Steph did find one not so long ago and we pinned it onto our Christmas tree as a decoration. It was dead when he found it, don't worry. Um, so we pinned it onto our Christmas tree as a kind of natural decoration and we were all so proud of it and the next morning we came in and a hornbill had eaten it. So <laughs> we were all quite disappointed about that. Hey Lucy Baker, it's so wonderful to have you on these live bushwalks and always nice to know that there's a new viewer along with us. I'm just wondering if you've still got comms, nothing. Okay, good. Well, let's keep going then. Sorry, everyone, I just thought we had lost uh, comms there with final control, so I was wondering what was going on, but it seems like everything is still in order. So, Lucy, great to have you with us. We are on a bushwalk. It is potentially dangerous, so that's why sometimes I'll whisper. Sometimes we'll stop, check the wind, which at the moment, as you can see, is blowing in the same direction that we are going in. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it's almost good that animals know that you're on the way. It's like phoning ahead and saying, we're making a booking at a restaurant. They can be ready for you. Not quite the same, but similar, as opposed to just arriving and startling animals or startling your restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and to a pro, you've just mentioned that if you started carrying an uh, ash bag or ash sock around wherever you lived, the only people that would know and appreciate what it is is the Safari Live crew. And you're probably right, especially if you do live abroad. I'm just going to chat with Steph quickly. <whistles> I didn't get a response from him that time, but... Not to worry, we'll work things out. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna continue on now, try and catch up with Steph, find out if he is still on the trail of the Inkohuma lioness. There should be five of them if they are still together, and we'll give you an update shortly. But for now, back to Brands. So we just decided to do a quick swing past Buffalo's Hook waterhole, what's left of it. And just to double check if the lions didn't sneak off in this direction. So I'll now head up onto the northern boundary and see if we get any luck there. too much rain, I think 0.2 of a millimetre, so actually no rain at all. So just a little sprinkling early on this morning, and it doesn't look like it's going to rain again to me, and temperatures are supposed to soar heading towards the weekend, and exactly, it's supposed to be about 108 Fahrenheit. So we'll enjoy a little bit of clouds while we have them. So 
a huge warm safari live welcome to Kylie Hartley, who's a new viewer. Uh, welcome, uh, Kylie. I hope you're enjoying the safari so far. Hopefully, we can find you a big cat before the end. Sorry, Kylie, I almost heard there. And Kylie is also wondering how uh, do you read the chats or whatnot. Kylie, what happens is that you guys will tweet or email through to our directors and final control. Sorry, I just got to be on the radio for a second. Standing by. Uh, just Nkonzo uh, and Kuma is going into that drainage line between Gari Cut Line, heading towards Buffalo's Cut Line and checking the boundary now. Thanks, man. I'm checking Aina Road now. Copy, thanks, Abel. Sorry, Kai. I've got to speak to the other safari guides out there. So, what happens is, Kai, you tweet or you hashtag or you send an email through and it pops through uh, to the lovely ladies uh, who are today, Nicola and Leanne. I wasn't sure who was in the, in the office there. And then they will send them through to us via this here. So that's the radio. So they will send the question through, and that's why I know, Kylie, you're watching right now. Okay, so this is the area where Scott said the tracks were heading into. I'm just going to jump up on the door here. Gives me a little bit more of a high vantage, and I can also see tracks quite nicely from here. There's a possibility they could have cut east into the bush. Those who watch the Juma Dam Cam, keep a close eye. Oops, there goes my ears. Um, keep a close eye because maybe they'll get thirsty and come for another drink. So, Tim in Arkansas is wondering how deep is the water table? Well, very at the moment. No, uh, our water table, most of the under a subterranean water setting at no more than sort of 15 to 20 meters, so not very deep at all. And unfortunately, some of the boreholes are starting to dry out already. And we've got a long, long dry season ahead of us. signal break up as we go through this very steep dip. Bear with us please. It does happen. And check the soft sand at the bottom. See if there are any tracks there. I 
those Scots on foot around here as well. Trying to find these cats for us. But if they are in this myriad of drainage systems, we're not going to be able to get a vehicle into most places in there. Well, there are some elephants making a serious commotion just behind us there. But again, sadly, you won't be able to hear it. But we, BM and, and I are both looking at one another with wide eyes going, Phew, what's going on there with the Ellie? So we'll keep, keep, keep the, them in mind. But we just want to quickly show you something. Not easy to see. You can just see a scuffle of sand. But if I try and show you, there's one, two, three lobes, the back pad. So I'm also just making it a bit crisper and fresher for you, as well as one, two, three, four toes. And these are the lion that Steph has been following. They've come out of the riverbed and through our whistle comms, we managed to get back in contact with one another and find one another here. So that's the good news. We're out of the riverbed and these lions are heading in a kind of north and easterly direction. Now what's interesting with these tracks is that Steph says they've been moving north in the riverbed for as long as we've been following them, which is probably about a mile, three quarters of a mile up to this point. And then all of a sudden they veered off 90 degrees almost in an in a, in a easterly direction. Now this tells you one thing, that they've probably heard something, smelt something, and are interested in going to try and catch it. So let's hope they've got lucky and that we're going to find them on a kill just around the next corner. Another little interesting artifact VM spotted in the bushes not too far from here is the skull of an animal. Now the horns will have grown out from here. We're not too sure what kind of animal this is. Um, possibly a kudu, possibly a waterbuck. But what's interesting is this. Look at the nasal cavities here. And usually there'll be very thin fins, I'm told, of kind of bone that will, you know, create a more of a barrier between the external part of the brain and the internal part of the brain, which is here. This is the brain cavity, the thinking chamber. And you can even see ever so slightly over here where the jaw bones will hinge, but it's not easy at all to see. So the, the jaw bones would have hinged onto these two little points underneath here. So the skull of an unfortunate herbivore, but we're gonna continue now and maybe find you a fresher skull with the Inkuhuma lioness. Let's go. Hi there, Wendy. And it's great to have you with us. And I'm so happy that you've sent through your question because we're gonna teach you something quite interesting at the moment. And that is that, Unlike the, ant, uh, the, the deer of various parts of the world which have antlers, none of the African antelope have antlers. We call them horns because they're very different to antlers. And like your question suggests, you'd like to know if the African antelope will ever shed their antlers. Well, no, they won't because they don't have antlers. They've got horns which go throughout the life of the animal, whereas antlers are shed seasonally. So they're similar structures, but something that's interesting is that unlike the kind of felty, uh, I'm just got stuck in the tree there with the long antenna, unlike the, the felt uh, fleshy kind of covering of antlers, which do have a, a, a foss growing bony inner, the external portion of a horn of, a, of, a, of an antelope is made out of keratin. So the same, uh, same substrates as your fingernail, sorry. I'm just getting distracted because I've spotted a baboon spider's hole here. Come and have a look at this, guys. So good to have you with us. None of the African animals have antlers, so the only horns you will find are ones that are snapped off. So, over here, we can see a big hole. And within this hole, and who's made this hole, is a baboon spider. And this baboon spider could be 10, 12, 15 years old. They live for incredibly long periods of time. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick this little piece of grass in here and see if we can't try and lure it out to get you a, a, a better view. What you must make sure if you ever do try this at home is to be very gentle and to use a very soft piece of grass at the terminal end because if it's not soft, it could puncture the soft skin of an animal like the baboon spider, um, which is essentially a tarantula. Let's see what happens here. It's 
kind of like fishing, I guess. And sometimes you'll just feel them gripping on to the end of your bait, I guess, which in this case is just going to be something that it feels moving. And that's often how spiders will detect their prey. Simply by movement, touching their webs, there's a, th a very thin film of webbing that lines the kind of extremities of this tunnel. But I think this baboon spider's hole is too deep for my little piece of grass. I'm certain it's active and in there there was a very very th fine layer of of webbing at the entrance to the hole that I did break but that does happen whenever the spider comes out which is every evening where she'll sit there in ambush so if we came back here much later in the evening she would be sitting at that hole and waiting for something to walk past and then she'll jump out grab it and then go back in so they're predominantly active nocturnally Ooh. Vim, we're going to take a gamble here. Let's see if we can't show this beautiful, beautiful butterfly. Oh, it's oh, it's tricky business for Vim, and it only opens its wings for two or three kind of flaps before it <laughs> before it closes them again. So I think we may be on a bit of a. Last mission there, but we tried. <laughs> that was called a yellow pansy. Okay, we're going to send you back to Brent to reboot the camera because it sounds like our picture is getting a little bit shaky. So, according to Scotty, who's just in the bush down there, the tracks have veered east towards the, the Buffalo's Hook Wall, the whole, all the remnants of. Maybe they just haven't got that far yet. I'll do one more loop around this block, then I think Scotty's got the best chance of uh, finding them on foot, being able to follow them track for track. And if we get nothing on Hyena Road, I think we might go check around Sydney's quick. Jake is 16, he wants to know, what do you guys do when it's so super hot? Well, Jake, I tend to keep myself quite close to the swimming pool. And even when you want to have a nap or sleep at night, sometimes it's so hot, uh, we'll take a kakoi like this and put it in a cold shower and then go to sleep with it wet over you. It's the only way sometimes to keep cool to sleep uh, when it's that hot. But you get used to the heat like anything. I just can't get used to the cold. Yep. False alarm, line like stop. Ashley in North Carolina is wondering what do the animals do during the dry season? Well, actually, they try to stay as close to water as possible. But for animals that need a lot of food, like elephant and buffalo, they'll actually move big distances between water and between food on a daily basis. So they're constantly moving. Sometimes lions will actually just almost set up shop at some of the pans and catch everything that comes their way. Joseph. Uh, Joseph is watching on YouTube and he would like to ask me a question. Joseph, you're more than welcome to ask me a question anytime. 
Uh, Joseph would like to know, are there different kinds of lions? Now, Joseph, this is a debate that has been going on amongst uh, zoologists and scientists for many, many years. I think there was, at one stage, I think nine or ten different subspecies of lions described, and those have pretty much all been debunked now. Uh, there is one, maybe two kinds of lions. Uh, there is the African lion and the Asiatic lion. So all African lions are closely enough related that they're not a separate species of, with current research. But there seems to be some distinct different genetic markers in the Asiatic lion species. So the lions that live in India in the Gear Forest National Park. So two types of lions, the African lion and the Asiatic lion. There were all sorts of things like Barbary lions and Barbie lion from Morocco, Kalahari lion, uh, those are basically just different manes uh, to deal with the desert, being much bigger, thicker, and extending all the way down their belly. Uh, so it was just rather uh, useful adapt adaptation for that specific area uh, rather than uh, an actual separate species. Hope that clears that up for you. Scotty can actually hear me talking and he's on the track, so we're in the right area. Now there's Franklin and Dwarf Mongoose alarm calling. Now when it's the small stuff alarming, you always check the trees first. Make sure they haven't been scared by a big bird. I don't see anything just yet. Could also be yeah, one of those you give me little that? mongooses yeah. we were trying to find earlier. Let's just turn that okay. loud, loud thing down. It sounds like that Franklin's just a little bit off to the right there. Just move a little bit further down the road. How do we keep all the animals out of the swimming pool and out of camp? Uh, well, the camps are fenced. Occasionally, we do have an interloper, uh, normally of uh, the reptile kind. But uh, we did have the hippo try climb in the pool not so long ago, and I had to chase them off. I just had used some stern language and a, and a stiff finger to keep them out of the pool. tracks on. I think they might have crossed, but I'm going to let Scott stay on those tracks. I'm going to head towards Sydney's, but while we do that, let's jump on foot with Scotty. Hello everyone, and as you can see, I'm on this vantage point, a big termite mound, hoping that we can scan a little bit further through this bush. Thankfully, it's not very thick here, so we can see quite far. We've just lost the trail of the lion tracks somewhere around here. And what's interesting is that you can see the hooves of buffalo churning up the dry dust as they hurtle away, trying to save their lives, obviously. So that's what's happened. The lion have obviously found what they smelt or heard from in the riverbed, causing them to change direction drastically. 
and we followed those tracks and now we've got to the area where we've seen the buffalo running. The buffalo did come running in this direction from a little bit behind us and one would naturally assume that the lion took chase after the buffalo. So we've got Steph also checking around carefully to see if there's any sign of where the buffalo has gone. There's quite a few hoof prints here. It's not easy to see, especially in this dull light. But, but I can see where the buffaloes run and I can also hear the elephants that are having some kind of a debate behind us there. We don't want to get caught in the middle of that. Something, especially for the newer view viewers, which is important to understand, is that it can be incredibly difficult to follow every single track while tracking. And the best weather for tracking is not overcast weather like we're experiencing now. And you may have noticed I was using my flashlight earlier, and that was to try and simulate the sun from a low angle, casting shadows on the side of the track, making it far easier to see. I found something here which looks like it could be the excavation of a honey badger or a mongoose. You can see here where it's been digging and possibly what it was taking was a dung, a dung ball that would have been buried by a dung beetle into this little hole and the little larvae or grub growing within that dung ball has been sniffed out by an animal like a honey badger or a mongoose and fed on. So interesting little meal was had there. Another little interesting sign of meals that were had is over here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to use a stick to pick up the rings of a millipede's body. How awesome is that? So not for the millipede I guess because it's been eaten by a scorpion and these are the leftovers that the scorpion did not feed on and the scorpion lives down in this hole here. You can see it's like a perfect horizontal coin slot, just like the shape of a scorpion. And here's all the housekeeping, the leftovers or excess that it's thrown out of its cavity once feeding on them. And interestingly, scorpions are one of the only animals out here that can feed on little millipedes, as well as civets, interestingly, because they've got a very cyto uh, or cyanide-like substance in their in their bodily fluids which causes them to be highly toxic to most animals. So we've just got a question through concerning the health and safety and that's from Key Eye in Arkansas and the safety on the walk if Steph being is, is our cover is Steph being out of sight safe and Yes and, yes, yes and no. Um, we know what we're doing out here. The rifle is an absolute last resort that Steph does carry. And it is just an extra set of eyes and ears. And to be honest, I feel very comfortable just myself and VM as we are. So we're just taking extra measures of caution and we are keeping very close to one another in whistling contact. Of course, something could go wrong, but then again, something could go wrong when you're driving to work in the morning, when you Hugely dangerous KR, but uh, good that you've picked up on that. Still, still just trying to find the, follow these buffalo's hoof prints, hoping that the lions are still going to be chasing them, but I just can't find any clear sign here. Yeah, the ground, ground is quite And KR, we've just got a question through from Safari Dean, which is going to allow me to kind of further discuss the topic of being on foot and is having a rifle essential? No, it's not or to have a rifle. Um, it is mainly for the safety of the cameraman and of course ourselves if something was to go wrong and it all depends on the individual, their level of confidence in the wilderness, their willingness to shoot an animal if in fact it does charge and it does get to a life threat. Are all these okay? Uh... Let's see if we can't climb up onto this termite mound and carry on chatting. Let's go on a signal hunt. Okay, cool. 
So I'm hoping that up on this termite mound, once VM gets up here, we're gonna get slightly better signal and picture. Steps just ahead of us. Um, and like I was saying, Safodin, I'm not sure how much you, you, you copied about the, uh, what, what I said earlier, but essentially, yes, we make sure that the rifle's here because of the cameramen, um, for everyone's safety, really, but it, it's not essential that people carry rifles. It's more obligatory when if something were to happen and your guy didn't have a rifle with paying guests, that would be something and laws or kind of guidelines when walking with guests. Four people, one rifle, but you'll find many camps in Africa put 10 people behind one rifle. So, you know, it, it, it all depends on the individual camp, the individual area in Africa you are and, and who your guide is. So, I hope that answers your question. Um, we are all comfortable though with our knowledge and experience on foot and like I said, the chances from something going wrong in a big city regardless of where you live in the world or what you're doing. Accidents happen, things go wrong, and that's something that I know every day and willingly accept. I couldn't think of a better place to be Uh, welcome back. I say I'm having a lot of problems with my earpiece here. I can't seem to hear, but at least I do know I'm live. And just try something here quickly. Aha. Uh -huh. Hey, there we go. All, all fixed. All fixed. And we're back. Sorry about that, seems like Scotty's got some gremlins. And while he checks where those lions might have disappeared too, I think let's go have a look at Sydney's waterhole. Maybe the mystery lions will appear. There, Gracie's eight years old, and uh, Gracie, so she's now got a special computer uh, to watch the drives, and she's very sorry she missed a few. Gracie, we forgive you, and hopefully the animals will come out to play. I'll see if I can find some elephants, because I know they're one of your favorites. Hopefully there's some elephants at Sydney's waterhole. If not, I think I know where some elephants are. Stephen says all the lions are experts at hiding from the safari live trackers today. Uh, it does seem that way. Uh, it happens every now and then that they do fox us, but generally not for too long. So we were 
chatting about how many lion species there are and Joanne in Michigan who's been watching the live drive since 2009. Well done Joanne. I would like to know whether the mountain lion or puma is not part of the lion family. It is not. It is a, it is a panthera. So it is uh, one of the big cats with the uh, flexible hyoid apparatus so that enables them to make loud noises. But uh, the puma is much, much closer to a leopard than to a lion, uh, both in size and behavior. James Richards wondering, is it possible that that cheetah is still on Juma? Uh, it is very possible. We haven't found any tracks of it leaving the property yet, but the last tracks were heading northeast, so to this area. Where those ever they decided to disappear? It looked like they were chasing each other. Yeah. Hello, Zebras. Looks like two young stallions that have been ousted from the herd. I'm looking a bit nervous. It could be the wind. Dampening their hearing a little bit. Very pretty, that green backdrop around. And there's been a large influx of zebra into our area with this drought, with the lack of water in Western Kruger and Southern Manuleti. The zebra numbers have definitely increased by tenfold. Before, when I started a year ago, it was an unusual, you well, not unusual to go three or four days without seeing zebra. And now, almost everywhere we go, we do see that there. And let's leave the little boys to meander off. Jog, jog, jog. And we're going to do the same. Continue meandering towards Sydney's waterhole.
Tammy in Indiana, thank you very much. Uh, Tammy in Indiana says she just loves the safaris. You learn something new every day. She didn't know there were Asiatic lions. And says, keep up the good work. We'll try, Tammy, and thanks for watching and jumping on the back of the vehicle with us twice a day. Sliding down towards Sydney's Dam. Some elephant tracks don't look too fresh though, they've been driven over. So let's uh, jump on with Scotty, and he's got some more tracks for us. Start talking to you here from them, otherwise you get caught. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Give us something. Nope. Oh, sorry, we're back with us. <laughs> uh, there we go. Well, that's the joy about being live. You never know what's going to happen. You always got to be prepared. So, <laughs> we haven't gone anywhere. There are some kudu here and some water, but we'll come back some. I was trying to pop down to the, the water's edge quickly. See what's happening there. Tracy in Virginia is obviously referring to, oh, look at that, there we go. Lovely little herd of ellies drinking. But, uh, Tracy was wondering why I didn't chase that cheetah down yesterday with my blinding speed. Well, you know, Tracy, I didn't want to make James look bad again, like the last foot race we had. So in these very dry times, the water holes are always a great place to check. So they do look a little bit not as rushed in this cool weather as they have been looking when they charge in on a hot evening. And he's sedately drinking. So you can see the young bull closest to us, slightly ostracized from the herd. Getting to that age where he's full of trouble. We're going to jump on with Scotty this time. Uh, hopefully he's there and he's got some tracks to show you. Everyone, and we've got good and bad news. We've caught up with the lion tracks again, which you can see here. Four toes again. The back pad at the back, but sadly they are crossing straight over our northern boundary. What I am going to do is that I'm going to use this opportunity to show you how a flashlight can help with tracking and how it kind of simulates uh, the, the tracking. In directly from above. Now these tracks are very deep depressions and soft sand, so it's easy to see, but watch how much easier the toes become to see and the outline of the track 
as the shadow goes from a side angle, as it would be when the sun rises at a low angle. So that's what you want for tracking. Very low angled sun, late morning, or sorry, early morning or late evening, as opposed to the middle of the day like that, when if these dep depressions weren't very deep, you'd be seeing nothing. Or an overcast weather like we're experiencing now. What's interesting is that you can also tell whether this is a left or right footprint. Now, when I try and put my left hand into the track, my fingers don't kind of match up. Whereas, I put my right hand in, boink, perfect. So this is the right paw of a lion. You can also tell back from front foot. I wish we had more tracks that are easier to see here, but sadly we don't. Um, but basically the front foot is the larger foot of all four-legged animals. Back feet, the smaller ones. The bulk of most four-legged animals is in the front. Therefore, they need the bigger surface area of their foot up there. Good stuff. We are going to send you back to Brent now. We're going to continue off um continue up. i'm not sure where we're going to go from here we find a place to explore maybe to the vehicle and keep you updated along the way so the elephants aren't the only current residents of the area around sydney's and some little water buck water buck bulls They seem to be becoming quite resident in this little area. We see them quite often in a group of about four or five young males. A little teenage bachelor group. The Eddies are about to leave. Off over there. Not in too much of a hurry, it seems. There's a flock of birds flying in. Look at the doves. So cat in Tampa is wondering, do an elephant's toenails continually grow? They do, but they're generally worn down very quickly, and that's uh, why that made that one on the dam cam so unusual. There we go, the Eddie's heading back towards the Manuleti, it looks like. Sedately so moving off. And I think David and I shall do the same. Head now towards the sort of western sections of Juma. See if there's anything happening there. So it seems like those lines have skedaddled, unfortunately. So hopefully they'll be back sometime during the night so we can look for them on the sunrise of the safari. beyond our northern, the northern boundary of our traverse, so we can't get any closer to that water hole, so that's why we park on the corner there and have a look at the distance. But we have found some wonderful sightings from around there recently, specifically the wild dogs have been spending quite a lot of time there. Kathy 
in Long Island is wondering, are we expecting any rain anytime soon? Unfortunately not, Kathy. I think these clouds are full of fallacies and lying, and I don't think we're going to get too much rain too soon. Germany is wondering, why is the water buck called a water buck? Well, is it because of their habitat or is it because they drink a lot of water? Well, Marla, it's because of a defensive mechanism they, they use when water is available. Uh, when there are predators around, the water buck will rush into the water to escape them. And it is a commonly used defensive tactic they use when they're close to water. And that defensive tactic gave birth to a wonderful little African folklore. And it's why the water buck has not been eaten by the crocodile. So many, many years ago, on a river somewhere deep in dark Africa, the crocodile sunbathing on the edge of the river. And a tree fell, a large branch fell on crocodile's back. He was stranded. Waterbuck happened to be moving past, and Crocodile begged Waterbuck to help him use those big horns to lift the branch off. And Waterbuck, very skeptical of Crocodile, you know, Crocodile is not the most trustworthy. Uh, they eventually broke an agreement that if the Waterbuck removed the big, heavy branch from the back of Crocodile, whenever a lion or leopard were trying to catch Waterbuck, be allowed to run into the water and survive unmolested by crocodile. Of course, this is not true, but it is a lovely little folklore, and we've got some giraffe. The baby on the road, not so little anymore. And there we've got the male and female who's going to go forward into the gap. Like this male has some amorous intentions. I don't think he's going to get anywhere because of the age of the baby, though. She's just trying to have a meal, move away, and he keeps following her constantly. impressed. Oh, maybe she is. A little bit of giraffe letting going on there. Now, if she's not the mom, then it could be time for mating. The youngster is sitting up in front of us here. Hello, little one. Eating on a buffalo thorn. comes and the big daddy. Still. And they are incredibly massive animals. The largest recorded giraffe weighed just under two tons. Two thousand kilograms. While we get into a spot to have another review with these giraffe, let's jump across to Scotty. Okay, everyone. So we are driving in a vehicle. Wap, wap, pop, 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 pop. We're actually not going that fast because we're off-road. And there's a small little branch in front of you, and you're driving off-road, and you think, huh, I can drive over that, no problem. But you are wrong because this is the sickle bush. And this bush has got these spines that are incredibly hard. Even this little one, maybe over here, VM, I'm gonna try and snap off with my Leatherman. And it's, it's difficult to, I mean, it's, 
I would never have been able to do that with my fingers. I'll try with this little one here. Oh, well, that one I did. Bad example. Basically though, these spines that grow out of the sickle bush, which are fairly, <laughs> which are fairly indistinct. You can hardly notice them really. These are the puncture makers. These are what puncture tires. So even though you see this kind of flimsy little frail bush as you're off-roading in the beginning of your guiding career, this will put holes in your tires. So this is one of the bushes you avoid at all costs. It's dead. It's been snapped off, which is interesting. Usually not too many animals eat on these that I've seen, but these, these leaves have wilted up and are drying up, so slowly dying. So not an example of a living one. Now, there was an interesting little insect, and I don't have a clue what it was. It was so well camouflaged, hiding. It's right here. Oh, well done, VM. Let me, oh, yeah. Okay, there we go. So look at how oh, incredible. Oh, there's two. It's a couple. Awesome. Now, if anyone has any idea what these creatures are, please let me know. I don't know if it's a kind of twig wilting beetle. I can see quite a long proboscis sticking out kind of along the, the, the underside of the abdomen. But how is that for, for incredible camouflage? And the great thing about stopping and looking at the smaller things just for a moment is you find so much life around you that ordinarily can be easily overlooked. I've also noticed something here now, which is a home. It's a kind of a nest cavity or, or, or an egg casing where all these leaves have been bundled up together. It may be difficult for you to see, but that's a little home in there. So it's important whenever on a bush walk or anywhere really in any wilderness area, sometimes just to sit down on the ground in a random area and really to start taking a closer look around you, you can find some really interesting nature. And possibly for a lot of you who don't have big game in the areas where you live or the countries that you live in, there's still so many small interesting animals that are, like I say, so easy to overlook. And I'm sure if we spent much longer here, we'd probably find some more animals to take a closer look at. So if you are feeling like you need a wilderness experience, maybe go sit in the bottom of your garden under some leaves and and see what you can find over there. Good stuff, we're gonna continue forth on our adventure and we're gonna send you back to the vehicle with Mr. Brent. So if we look at those giraffe's legs, you'll notice the skin is very taut and tight. And giraffe's legs in particular were studied intensively by scientists while they were developing space suits and fighter pilot suits because to stop the blood rushing through to the legs obviously the giraffe has that very constricted skin around the legs to stop too much blood getting there and so anyone who is ever going to go to space or flies a f1 or what's an f16 not sure what those all are fighter jet have a giraffe to thank that they don't pass out and plummet to the ground. So as the male continues his amorous intentions, now with people, giraffe being such an iconic species for quite a long time have been painted or drawn and they are actually in the, the Sahara Desert, uh, the Kifian race, which are also known as the Nubians, uh, actually made life-size of engraving two, of two giraffe and it's the world's largest petroglyph is actually of two giraffe in the, the Sahara Desert. And how Europe and the Western world came to know about giraffes was due to the ancient Egyptians. They kept them as pets and sort of curiosity animals of the pharaohs and they were the first to ship them across the Mediterranean and the Greeks and were the, one of the first to acquire giraffes. And they thought they were a terrible union between a camel and a leopard. Very strange. And it's amazing how 
people you would think in the ancient Greeks you had amazing philosophers and scientists would have thought that a camel and a leopard could have babies and that would be a giraffe so it looks like the lady has managed to avoid too much attention now and is being able to have a good feed says apart from the eddies she likes to call the giraffes gentle giants as well uh, another race of people that had a huge fascination with giraffes were the ancient chinese and in 1414 a giraffe was shipped to china by the chinese explorer zheng he the Ming Dynasty and in Chinese culture, for some reason, giraffe are very closely associated with the mythical quillin, which I'm not quite sure what that is. I'm gonna have to look that up. Oh, why did you guys find out what that is for me? Q I L I N, and it's a Chinese mythical beast or person, maybe. She's off again. We shall do the same. See if we can find some left tracks. Shadows are fast in this area. So, if you know the answer what acrylin is, please send that through to me and you can do that on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. That is really, really interesting. Uh, Darlene has asked, uh, she's heard me speak about grasshoppers, but not crickets. And she says she loves the folklore and Native American folklore. Uh, you drink dried cricket tea to make you a better singer. Darlene, we do get crickets here. Uh, they are mostly nocturnal. And also with this drought, I'm afraid, we're not gonna see too many of them. I think we have shown them, I have shown them once on the live drives was an amorous pair of crickets that, and on that occasion, but we do get crickets, yeah. So while we check the western reaches of Juma, let's jump back on to terra firma with Scott Dyson.
So good to have you guys back on the bush walk with us. We're slowly perusing down back in the direction we came from on a slightly different pathway, hoping to find you guys some smaller little interesting things to look at, possibly some more insects, possibly some more tracks and signs of where animals have been, as well as the chance of possibly bumping into some elephants. We heard a lot of elephants audio when we were moving north up to where we got to, so now we're heading south back towards them. So we could bump into some of them, and because they are dangerous, we are gonna be cautious. So the trusty old ash bag, and this I think is one of the most useful tools when walking in the bush. I'd feel a lot less safe without this, and this ash bag is what's allowed me to have some of the most incredible encounters on foot, getting really close to the animals without them even knowing you're there. Cindy, I'm so, so sorry to hear that you weren't watching the sunrise safari because you're hoping to see a praying mantis. And Steph found an incredible, incredible flower mantis this morning. I think that's what they call beautiful colorations. It's worth having a look in some of the archives or some of the screenshots that were taken of it. But there are many different types of mantises. This one that Steph found had remarkable camouflage. It's a miracle that he managed to find it in the first place. And Cindy, now all I am looking for is one of these creatures for you. The best time to find them is at night. They tend to be more active at night, or possibly that's simply because of the fact that we find them hunting around our light bulbs, uh, which are full of insects. So perfect praying ground for the praying mantis. Now, I can't remember the name, but somebody mentioned something about Mapani bees earlier. And you'd like to know if there's any correlation between their name and the name of the Mapani tree. Um, and Genevieve in New York, thanks Nikki for reminding me. Um, not that I know of. Um, I chatted to Steph as well and he seems to think that it's mainly because the, the, the bark of the Mapani trees is quite creviced, it's got quite deep grooves, and it allows the Mapani bees to make little hives within there. What I've been really naughty about is that there is actually one of these Mapani beehives here on Juma that I've never showed you. We're a little bit too far away from it now, but please remind me on my next bushwalk, Genevieve, to go and show them to you, because it's an incredible, incredible little hive. Are you joking, Cindy? You owe Steph. He's found your praying mantis already. <laughs> one that's camouflaged like a piece of grass. Oh, uh, and on top of it, just being one that looks like a blade of grass. Well done, Steph. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> this is incredible. And a good reason why we are so fortunate to have Steph on the... find the right tool to show it to you. Here it is here. Steph, that is mind-boggling. Um, so, <laughs> James is starting to be, started calling him the mystic boer, um, as opposed to the winter boer, and I don't know, I think we need to think of something, uh, something else. So I love the mystic boer, but something to do with your ability to find these critters is just phenomenal. Um, let me see if I can't get it I don't want to distress it too much. You can see it's not interested in us and it's probably so surprised it's, that anything's ever found it. This is probably the first time it's ever had to deal with visitors or intruders. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna leave it to itself. It's obviously uh, got this incredible camouflage for a reason. It's shy and doesn't like spending time with anyone. It likes going unnoticed. But there we go, Cindy. A tiny little praying mantis to you and well done, Steph, wherever you've disappeared off to. <laughs> Absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> anyway, um, Genevieve, as I was saying, if you are desperate to see a little Mapani beehive, I do have a little video on my Facebook page, my Dave and Alan Safari, and in that video, um, there's a little segment where you can see the tiny little pipe. They create this translucent, very, very small tube that is their kind of landing pad that they land on, and then they move through about two, three inches of this translucent tube into the hive. So it's this incredible little structure. So that's a good indicator of these Mapani bees. And they're tiny, tiny, tiny little stingless bees. So of no harm to us, friendly bees. Although even the stinging bees are friendly because without bees on our planets and 
It's not looking too good for the future of bees and therefore us without them, but they are incredibly, incredibly critical components on the planet because without them we lose so, many so much pollination of different plants and without plants we are going to have a barren earth that is not going to be much fun to live on. And I'm told there's lots of research being done on bee populations around the world and it's not looking very pretty. Oh, we have just found a crime scene. Looks like the lions could well have been active here. This, I've just seen some more, what looked to be like massive warthog tusks over there. But I'm gonna start with this. This looks like a kind of hip flex, hip or maybe a shoulder. You can see a ball joint that's been rubbed smoothly here. So possibly a shoulder or a I don't think it's up, I think this is more of a shoulder or possibly a kind of a knee or an ankle. Some part of a joint that's needed that ball joint mechanism, much like your kind of heel and or your knee and or your shoulders. But let's carry on to what's really caught my attention here. This looks incredible. It looks like multiple crime scenes. <gasps> this is ridiculous. Look at how big these warthog tusks are. I'm just gonna polish them up quickly so I can have them ready for a good display for you. This is so cool. Which way did they go? Hang on. I'm getting ready for a reveal. Ta-da! <laughs> so these are some really big warthog tusks. And these ones have actually been on the top jaw. And I found a little piece of the jaw here, give me a second please, that this tusk would have come out of. Fits perfectly like that, there we go. Um, and what you can see is how the bottom side of this uh, tusk is worn absolutely smooth and that's from the set of bottom tusks which we should look around for maybe we'll find them but they're very small thin and sharp and those are the razor blades that help to protect the warthog but this is how it would have worked the other one would have come out like something like this and what's great that we have found the, the this part of the the body is that you can see that the tusks ordinarily wouldn't have been as long as they look when i just put them against my cheek like that they would have been embedded into the root system then there would have been a bit of flesh overhanging so you'll probably only find that about that much was sticking out so two animals were killed here one looks like a buffalo certainly these bones here are not that of a warthog we'll leave those there but yeah, this is not the, the bone of a warthog. Don't you guys worry about that. It would have been a gigantic, very scary creature if that was the case. This is something like a buffalo. What's interesting is, uh, uh, unlike the, the other bone we saw earlier that would have received a portion of bone like this, this is the kind of ball as opposed to the ball joint that it fits into. Let's just go and check if it fits actually. I don't think it's going to. Nah. It's. Oh! No. Ambitious. But you kind of get the idea. You can see that smooth round part. You can see the ball there, but it's not. It's not working out here. Good. That was awesome. Absolutely awesome stuff. I know some of you, oh, Raybo, <laughs> you've started calling me a Scott hog and let me piece a bit more of this puzzle together for you guys. There we go. So I found the other portion of the nose. Let's see how this is supposed to work. You see, I wasn't very good at building puzzles as a kid. As you can probably tell. What is going on here, Scott? Why am I being so... Oh, uh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Yeah, there we go. The nose there. Like that. There we go. Isn't that incredible? Epic. It would have been... This would have been the front of the nose. Over there. 
and like he just said, it looks like a cow's horns, I guess. It does, kind of. A very, very big warthog for this area. Like a lot of animals in Africa, it all depends on the area that you find them and their size and shape may vary greatly. But this is a prime specimen. What's also interesting is that we've seen the work of hyena here. I mean, these carcasses have been completely dismembered, torn apart. That other animal was a large animal, but there's hardly any remains of it. As well as this, this has probably been cracked open by a hyena to get the juicy nasal cavity out of there. I wonder what that tastes like, a little bit of water, water nostrils. Ugh. But it all goes to show that not much goes to waste out here. And all the animals, even the ones that sometimes people don't like, are very important and have their jobs out here. Hello, Laura in Pennsylvania. You're saying due to the fact of the drought that it's not clever to be playing with bones at the moment um, due to the risk of anthrax. Um, you could be right. Those bones have been there for a very, very long time. I'm not too concerned by it. Um, I'm more concerned of water holes. They, for me, are areas that hold the anthrax virus stagnant for many years. So I'm not too concerned, but maybe I'll come unstuck. Thank you for the warning though. Hello Jan Hemming or Jan Hemming, not sure how to pronounce your name. Good to have you with us. You would like to know what this very fancy ash bag, which is just a sock, of mine does. What is the relevance of having it on this bushwalk and why is it so important? Why did I say it's such an important tool? Knowing uh, your, your, the wind direction is so critical, Jan or Yan, um, because animals' senses of smell are so much greater than ours and this is just such an effective way of very easily being able to test the wind without having to try and find some sand. And I mean, look at how well that worked, okay, compared to this. Although that also works fairly well because it's only so dry and dusty and we're in the middle of a drought though. <laughs> but you do have to bend down, make a noise, lose focus of where you're looking. Whereas this, it's in my pocket, it's always ready. And I've permanently got the ability to test wind. Um, only on one occasion since I've been on a bushwalk have I been in a situation where I've spent a long time with a breeding herd of elephants that were on the move and typically they can be very dangerous but because the conditions were right and because of this ash bag I could use the wind and because I knew the wind was always just in my favour I managed to stay with that breeding herd for about 20 minutes and they had absolutely no idea I was there. If I did not have this ash bag I would never have taken that chance because there was moments when the wind was teetering so close to them being able to pick up our scent. So that's why I think it's so important. The animal senses are so much better than ours, especially their sense of smell. And it just gives you so much confidence being on foot, knowing that either animals can smell you like now, we are moving in the same direction and therefore we can also expect the appropriate responses and behavior from them. Like I said a little bit earlier, having this ash bag, uh, well not having the ash bag, but walking with the wind is almost like kind of phoning a restaurant and telling them you're on the way. Um, you're letting the animals know indirectly that they can expect to see you. Whereas if the wind is not in your favor, they're going to be very startled. Um, and a startled animal is a dangerous animal. So you want to try and avoid that at all costs. Just moving some sickle bushes out the way there so VM doesn't get a puncture. Sorry, Vim, I've chosen a terrible route here. Hello, James Bear, and good to have you with us again. You'd like to know what else is in my backpack other than the hydration pack with some whiskey in it. Um, James, there is a couple of books, a roll of toilet paper, um, first aid kits, a few other bits and pieces, a little flint in order to ignite a fire. Not a huge deal at the moment, um, but because we are doing generally quite short walks here, we don't need to be prepared for, for doomsday. So yeah, as long as the whiskey is in the hydration pack, you kind of got everything you need. Um, and toilet paper, of course. Toilet paper is very important. You never know when you might need to blow your nose.
Hello, Matty. My good friend, just nine year old, watching in Ohio. And Matty, you want us to try and lure out a baboon spider for you. I'm not sure if you were watching earlier, Matty. We did try unsuccessfully though. My baboon spider fishing is not up to scratch at the moment. But thankfully, we've got Steph here. And if you manage to find uh, Cindy a praying mantis, who knows, maybe he might be able to find you a baboon spider as well. It is tricky business though, Matty. And as much as we love to show you as much as we can with all the animals out here, some of them, uh, you know, we would have to interfere a little bit too much to, to find them. You know, sometimes like scorpions, in order for us to get them out of their homes, you have to break their homes. So that's the last thing we want to do and we'd rather just keep waiting patiently until the right time eventually we might find a baboon spider outside of its burrow even though it's uncommon it is possible and that way we'll get to show you then without having to harm them or interfere with them and that's the the kind of the beauty of being on these live safaris is that over time you will eventually get lucky and you will get to see all the little things that you want to see But Matty, we'll definitely try and maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to lure one out of its uh, burrow just to the entrance. They'll never come the whole way out and all you'll be able to see is this kind of front sets of legs, it's little mouth chelicerae moving around. You'd like to know how big they are as well, Matty, and they vary in size, but very similar to tarantulas. They're the same kind of a, a spider as a tarantula, they're just a different name. And some of their, their bodies, actual body may be about that big, and then including their legs, I mean, they could easily fill up your hand. They fit into, I mean, that burrow earlier was about that big. Now, a large spider can squeeze itself into that burrow with its legs. So don't be fooled, the hole that size is going to have a very big spider in it. That one we, we, we tried earlier was a monster of a hole. Oh, it is such a beautiful evening, everyone. <laughs> James, you're interested to know how big my hydration pack is, whether it's a one liter or a two liter. It's actually, I think, a three liter. So I need three bottles to fill it up. Okay, we're gonna continue perusing around. Interestingly enough, I'll come clean. I got completely disorientated and lost track of the direction I was moving in. And as, instead of heading south, we've been heading west and I've just realized because we're very close to a road. So there's coming clear, but just goes to show without the sun being up, it's not as easy to know directions. But, you know, granted I have been focusing on you guys more than the direction we're moving in. Um, it, it, it does highlight the fact that it is difficult to work out where you're going when it's cloudy, especially after dark when you cannot see any clouds or have any kind of light uh, from where the sun is moving in. Okay, we're gonna send you back to Brent to see what he's up to, and hopefully we'll have something exciting to call you back to in a short while. So the only thing exciting is being out in the bush. We don't have anything. Um, we're busy heading towards the treehouse waterhole. Let's see if there's possibly any animals that have gone to drink out of that little natural seat. Really hoping for a predator, but I think about now anything will suffice. It's very quiet. Okay, I'm leaving the lot of luck table there on his own. Bouncy, bouncy. Heading down here is hyena tracks. Well, we had quite a nice little giraffe sighting over there, and Benji M in LA, the city of angels, would like to know. Is the female giraffe always a lighter colour than the male? Generally, yes. I have been in very, very abnormal circumstances. You'll get a female darker, but it normally is yes. The males have uh, have dark colouring, and it's probably just to do with their hormones increasing the men inflation. Now, I've got a question for all of you guys out there. Who can tell me? What is the largest ruminant in the world? 
Now, a ruminant is an animal that chews the cud. It's got four stomachs. So what is the largest ruminant in the world? And if you know that answer, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So we're approaching the treehouse waterhole. One more little root bump to pop over. Oop, wow. a bit of a quiet moment between sightings another one on youtube would like to know a bit of a backstory to my bracelets i don't actually have all of them on at the moment um, this one here is uh, copper and bronze and it is actually from the last trip andrew and i did in zimbabwe from kariba dam wall itself there we go and uh, this one if i remember correctly is from Livingston in Zambia. And this one is actually from the Copper Belt in Zambia. I do have a few more, but if I put too many on there, make a banging noise while we're on safari. So I've got a couple from all over the place. Got some from Gabon, got some from Kenya, from Tanzania. He's got something really interesting, and we're going to jump across to him to see what the Jackie Hangman's been up to. This is not why you came across to us, but it's still interesting. And what has happened here is that there's some ants that Steph tells me are called slender ants that are very clever and they cause these massive thorns from the acacia tree to swell and they do that by irritating the plant when it's young and growing and that causes the plant to send these growth hormones to cause this bulge. Now this bulge is then bored into through a tiny little hole. You can see that over here and this whole chamber is then hollowed out so it becomes a home. Here you can see inside I think a little bit. Um, it becomes a home for these slender ants and possibly they also may feed on the inner parts and uh, that is caused by that growth hormone called gibberellins that plants send out when they need help. So that's one thing that's interesting about this thorn. Then the other thing about this tree is that if we take a look over here we'll find where a bird, we're not too sure which bird it was, it could have been one of a couple, mainly the shrikes, also known as butcher birds for this very reason, will impale their prey onto thorns or barbed wire fences where there are lack of thorns and that will have a larder to come back and feed on whenever they desire. So we're not going to disturb this one. I'm not sure if it has in fact been fed on or if it's going to be a tasty treat, treat for later. But essentially it's a good idea to just leave excess food in a clever place where other animals cannot get to it easily. And that way if you are finding it hard to find food, you can come back to these larders that you've stored up over time. So maybe the red back trike, but it seems a bit small to be carrying such large prey like that. Um, I'm not too sure what other birds to, to, to throw out there. I've never actually seen birds doing that, which makes it difficult. But you are going to be going back to Brent now, so I'm sure he'll be able to throw in some of his own thoughts and whether he's possibly seen the physical shrike or fiscal shrike impaling any of its prey on thorns like this or any other birds that he may know of. Cool. Over to Brent and we'll catch up later. So, I Scotty found a, a dung beetle impaled on a thorn, and it 
this year that culprit is possibly probably the red back strike and quite commonly do that fiscal strikes as well and i've seen them do it many times fiscal strikes on our old family farm actually used to pin all the insects on the barbed wire fence uh, around the house and my grandfather used to call them the jackie hangman and apparently that was the name for them in the bird books in that when he was a young boy the jackie hangman or fish the school shark or yeah more than likely to be a red back shark or magpies I've already put on my lights and you believe it's so early on this cloud cover is producing a difficult light Tony in London, who would like to know what, um, what properties border Juma, and he says Sydney's dam is off the north, am I currently on the western boundary? Well, I'm, I'm currently almost smack bang in the middle of Juma, uh, on the Pangolin track, but the properties that surround us are Biffle's Hook, Torchwood, Chitwa Chitwa, Little Gauri, Hoffman's, Arethusa, Sipambil. I think I got them all. Now, we only traverse on Arethusa and the Juma. The Juma is able to traverse on Torchwood, Buffles Hook, and Cheetah Plains. So they've got a really big traverse area. to Kathleen, Christine, Janine and Becky, who were the first people in on the giraffe quiz. Well, well done. The, oh, sorry, not the giraffe quiz, the largest ruminant quiz, and the answer is a giraffe. All right, you guys are too smart for me today. I can't catch you. I'm going to have to find a more difficult question for you. Second largest, I have to think about, uh, is probably an acarpi, uh, which is the only living relative of a giraffe. And then after that, you're probably looking at Lord Derby's Eland. And then Livingston's or Southern Eland, the one, we, uh, the one that, can, that occurs in this part of the world. And then probably Buffalo. Might have missed one big one somewhere. Don't think so though. The other big ones, rhinos, elephants, and hippos are not ruminants. camp out in the bush. Is it safe? Sounds like an exciting way to spend a night under the full moon. Well, Cap, you shouldn't be seeing the full moon from your tent, so it is it is safe to camp out in the bush as long as you are in a tent, and so the predators can't see, see you. Even that flimsy little piece of nylon will keep you safe. However, if you decide that you want to sleep outside under the full moon, you are when you get eaten, I think there's something called the Darwin Awards, and if you're stupid enough to sleep outside where the lions and hyenas are, it's better for the human race. But so, uh, we do camp out, but never out in the open. Uh, we will camp in a tent. So, 
hyenas, while you're awake, are absolutely no threat at all. Uh, you can often just chase them off even at night. But when you're asleep, they are the greatest sneaks and will take advantage. And there are quite a few people, I've actually met quite a few people in African villages in my travels, uh, missing pieces of feet, hands, ears, nose, face, skull even. Uh, takes a bite, checking if you're dead, uh, and then when you wake up, you get surprised. Actually, when I was in the Sabi Sands quite a few years ago, on a property to the south of where I was working, uh, there was an old lady who was actually killed by a hyena. She forgot to close her door, and the hyena came in in the night and dragged her off. You must always remember to close your door in the bush as well. And well, hyena actually, I think probably of all the predators in the last 10 years or so in the Sabi Sands have accounted for two people that I know of. The other was a security guard. Yeah. No, it wasn't a security guard, it was an off-duty butler or waiter. Um, he fell asleep in front of the TV with the door open and hyena came in through and got him as well. Now, there's some fascinating stories of man-eaters throughout Africa. And we'll get onto those a little later. But while we're on the subject of hyenas, I've got a very funny story about a hyena. Now, there was a very known, a very, very well-known game warden who used to operate in southern Tanzania. And it was during the formation of some of the national parks some of the villagers did not want to move out of the national park. One must remember this was a very different time, uh, the colonial era. And so the villagers didn't want to move out of the park. And for whatever reason, nothing that this very well-known warden tried could get them to leave. So him and his friend, who was the state vet for the southern town there, were probably sitting around a fire imbibing an amber liquid, no ice, being that far off in the bush. And they came up with a cunning plan. Now, I'm not condoning this in any way, but it is quite amusing. So especially back then, uh, rural times there, yeah, even today, uh, superstitions are very, very powerful. And the hyenas are often associated with witchcraft. They're called the witch's pet or the witch's helper, said to be sent to do murders for witches. Uh, as well as which is general transport around on a on a dark night. So they happened to have some ketamine and other drugs. They mixed them up and they went and darted this hyena. Oh, a hyena. They then put a pair of khaki shorts on it. So like my shorts, they put the shorts on the hyena, strapped it on and then went and woke the hyena up and let it go around these villages that didn't want to move. One look at a hyena wearing shorts and everyone was gone within 48 hours. Convinced that the area was now bewitched, there was an evil witch coming, we gotta get out of here, and now. So that was a very long time ago, that was probably in the 1940s, if I remember correctly. just been chatting about hyenas and Rania in Texas and she's been watching since November. Well, welcome on board. And she'd like to know why we haven't stopped at the hyena den. I was there this morning and there were no hyenas. So we have been there, but if there are no hyenas there, we don't, generally don't show it to you and we just move on. So it's not that we haven't been checking, it's just that the hyena den hasn't been active. So we're gonna continue on, see what else we can find. And while we do that, let's go across to Scotty, who's got an insect we're not going to see too much of in this drought. So, as VM journeys along the thorn bush, you can now see a cicada, or a cicada, as it's more 
commonly pronounced in America. Interesting how we pronounce things differently in different parts of the world. And how awesome are these views? Got its big eyes staring down the barrel. And it's a very interesting animal that has the ability to make this high-pitched kind of a screeching sound. And they've got a drum-like organ called the tympanum that's got basically a tendon attached to the middle of this large kind of a drum and the tendon is attached to a muscle that can reflex at incredibly high repetitions causing that drum to whee sing and often when we're driving around they haven't been hugely vocal recently and like Brent says they are going to be few and far between in the drought conditions but in a normal summer they cause oh it just had a pee did you guys see that it literally just had a pee never in my life would I would have thought we would have seen that I don't know if you may have seen it maybe we can try and see a slow-mo but something definitely came out the rear end of this creature Anyway, sadly, we haven't been hearing too much of them. They do have the ability to fly, and you can probably see its wings there along the side of its body. So if we were to disturb it, it would fly off. And what's interesting is usually there's more than one of them in any given bush, but I can't see any more here. And Nikki has had a look uh, in slow-mo. She has rewinded. She couldn't see anything. Maybe it was just me uh, losing my mind, or maybe it did in fact do it, and it was just the wrong angle for the camera to pick it up. It was obviously uh, just a tiny little little squirt. Now Brent tells me, uh, well I hear rather that Brent was telling you guys about hyena and how they can be very dangerous animals especially if you fall asleep with your door open and it does remind me of a terrible story from here in the Salby Sands where one of the staff members fell asleep in the staff TV room watching his favorite TV show a late night movie and the next thing the night porters the security guards who keep an eye on the camp at night making sure all the guests are safe when they're moving between their rooms heard this commotion ran there but by the time they got there it was too late so it is a very real threat a very real reality that you do need to be extra cautious of interestingly enough often all you need as a protective layer against these large wild dangerous animals is a tent I mean even a mosquito net offers enough protection if you if you're willing to and I remember camping in various parts of very remote wilderness areas in Africa under nothing other than a mosquito net which is a wonderful way to camp out um, I probably wouldn't have done it without a rifle in bed next to me and I'm told that this all originated from Kat's question regarding camping and it's unbelievable how safe you actually are, provided you are just fully enclosed in your tent. You shouldn't have any trouble. You may have a few kind of hair-raising uh, moments where elephants, lions, hyenas, you name it, come sniffing up to your tent. But generally, all they're wanting to work out is what you are. And if the door is not open, they typically tend to leave you alone. And the beauty of camping with a mosquito net, like I was telling you about, is all you need is a mosquito net that I could bundle up into a backpack like this, a little rope that you just throw over a limb of a tree, and then you just pull it up, and you could literally just sleep on the ground or on a very small bedroll that you carry. Um, I need to post some pictures of some of the campsites where I have camped in the past. I might even have some on my phone. I'll have a look through and see if I can show you. Um, it was the ultimate in camping under these mosquito nets in the middle of Katavi National Park in Tanzania. A beautiful, beautiful wilderness area that I would love to go back to. Ooh, interesting question through from Pamela. You're interested to know if adult elephants have ever managed to sneak their way into houses. And not a house, not a kitchen that I've heard of, but there's certain lodges, I think they're in Botswana, where elephants literally walk through the foyers. It's a massive open uh, kind of plan entrance into the camps where there are no doors, just a big thatch roof, and then you walk in open air past the reception and then down into probably the, the lodge gardens. And you've got these pictures where the elephants are literally just walking straight through the entrance into the middle uh, of the, the camp environs. But no, I've never had any uh, herd 
cleared of any problems with elephants trying to get into houses for food, maybe sticking their trunk in through a window in order to drink water out of a toilet or steal an orange out of a fruit bowl. Um, I know they certainly do that uh, when you're camping, that if you leave your, your vehicles open with lots of fruit in them, or possibly even if you don't leave them open, they may try and peel them open like a can um, in order to get to the sweet smelling treats inside there. But haven't heard too many problems. So generally, as long as you keep yourself enclosed and your food enclosed, everything away from the animals, they tend to not cause too much trouble. Although, having said that, on the topic of elephants coming into your actual homes, something that we can uh, expect to find, and I'm actually surprised we haven't been experiencing more of it at the moment, is that usually in winter, which is not now, but it's the equivalent of a winter because we're in the drop, but usually in the winter in the Sabi Sands when it's very dry, you will find very clever elephants that find their way into the camps, which often have electric fences around them, sometimes designed to keep all animals out, not very effectively, I guess, because some of the animals can get in regardless of how hard you try especially elephants who have got this incredible ability to get into whatever they want to or get out of whatever they want to, even if it is electrified. Elephant fences are usually two strands high up off the ground allowing everything else to pass underneath. Um, but the bottom line is regardless of what fence you put around a camp, if elephants want to get in, especially wise old bulls, they'll find a way and they'll stand on a pole, push it down, step over the fence and then have this oasis of untapped resources. Nothing's, uh, nothing's fed on the, f the, the, the gardens for a long time. They've often been watered so there's a lot of delicious, well watered plants waiting to be snacked on. But here at Juma, we haven't had any trouble yet. Um, we've just had a hippo um, try to climb into the swimming pool. Can you blame it? Not really. Um, but no, no, no problem with elephants yet, but it is something that is probably going to happen soon. Just letting VM get past with his uh, long antenna pole. Oh. Well, James Bear, you have just said that it wouldn't be a clever idea to apply the mosquito nets uh, in areas where there are a lot of bears like North America because they are not going to take heed to that thin layer of protection. Um, so thank you for that advice. I will not be taking my uh, mosquito net to North America when I finally do go in search of bears. And Mauricio is interested also just a little bit more on that topic to understand how is it that the mosquito net or the tent is enough to prevent predators from actually just tearing it apart. And a good question. I'm not too sure. I mean, we need to remember that predators are opportunistic. So uh, if the opportunity is good, they will take it. But if it's not quite right, you know, maybe they'll decide against it. So maybe that's just uh, all that it takes. Um, from time to time, maybe there have been some horror stories where, you know, a lion or a hyena has broken into a tent. Um, there's always exceptions to the rule. But in general, as long as you're enclosed, they may sniff out of, inquis uh, you know, out of in the inquis inquisitivity as opposed to hunger. It's not uh, something, Mauricio, that they would have been actively seeking out. I mean, unless it's a man-eater, you know, they, they know that we smell like humans and buffalo smell like buffalo. So I hope that explains it, Mauricio. I'd love to chat more with you guys, but you are off to the hyena den. So no one is around when we popped in to the den this morning. But now it seems like everyone's out and about. There's the small, small, the, the smallest you see from there. cub popping out. Thank to you. the right. There we go, the youngest member, born around January. Oh, and there's one of the terrible, there we go. They're the two little guys. Hello, little horrors. What mischief are hey, you? Oh, we nearly got the, the hubcap. The hubcap brigade arrived behind me. And, oh, look at this. Oh, there's a big female, but there's also a person that he's coming to have a look at. The new cameraman, give him a slip. That, that one doesn't smell like anyone I know. This is Dave's first time 
got a bit of beating. That terrible team. See the submissive behavior by the terrible team. Lifting the leg, showing the exposed soft underparts. Associated with witchcraft in Africa. And lots of folklore surrounds hyenas in Africa. And from a European point of view, they're often considered to be quite cowardly scavengers. So there's some mischief happening in front of us. There we go. So the, these two. Here we go. Here we go. It was a <laughs> bound to happen. That's not your mom. Um, hyenas do not have any cooperative suckling. So only their offspring will suckle. They will not let and not and will not let a, a, a cousin or whatnot cycle. It has to be a direct offspring from the female. And also they practice something that is quite often probably another one of the reasons that they have that bad rep and it's called Sibilicide or Cain and Abel syndrome. So if they give birth to two of the same sex, generally females, the firstborn will kill the other with its oh, nip, <laughs> with its milk teeth. And very, very fascinating. Sorry, you guys, we're just having a bit of a problem with the microphone. Hopefully that fixes it. Oh, chase Dolf. I'm just causing trouble there. Sorry guys, we're still just trying to sort out what's going on with this microphone here. I'm trying to see if I can try that, if that makes any difference. Okay, bear with me for a second, I'm going to switch it off. And on. So if we go a little bit to the right, the mother of those two little tiny black cubs is just, we can just make out her back. Up, sorry, you see there? There we go, to the right. And center screen. So we can just see her back and I can hear the cubs suckling and whining. And obviously fighting over teats. Now, I think have some very, very Interesting adaptations, being the only truly matriarchal society. And even within the hyenas, they have less nipples, so fewer mammary glands for the cubs to feed off, but they generally never give birth to them more than two. And as I said, and if they're both of the same sex, one will expire quite quickly. 
and the other will kill it with its milk teeth. It's also the only mammal species. Sorry, guys, it seems like the mic is still. Just going to keep quiet, and Dave's going to take your tour of our humans while I try to fix this mic. Let's see if that's made a difference. Okay, when in doubt, turn everything off. Okay, I've tried to reset everything. Let's see. Now, if it th still continues to make those funny noises, I'll just sit up and talk to the back mic. I'm going to have to talk a little bit more carefully to the back microphone. Sorry, it is incredible now. Look at the little ones. They're so cute. It's got a stick in its mouth. We decided playtime is, well, dinner time is over. It's now time for playtime. It is also the only mammal that lacks an external vaginal opening. So that elongated clitoris is also part of the vagina. And so generally also with the first set of cubs born to a young female hyena, they normally die because that opening is very constricted and they suffocate while that first, during that first birth. But then after that, the females are able to give birth with a lot a lot more ease. some scarring on her face. Sandra in California says so she's learned so much about hyenas and has now has a special affection for them since watching Safari Live. I do too, they are one of my favorites. The little ones cutting away in the distance. So while we're sitting with a spotted hyena, there are a few other hyena species out there. And who can tell me what is the only hyena species that occurs outside of Africa? And if you know what hyena species occurs outside of Africa, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So we're going to sit here and see what's happening out and about at the den. But while we do that, let's go have a look what Scotty's got on foot. We're going to need to keep it down now, everyone. Um, we've heard some branches breaking up ahead here. Steph says he's heard some belly rumbles. His hearing is much better than mine. And it's in all likelihood some elephants. So we need to be careful. The wind is in our favor. Up ahead. It's kind of wind is from a westerly direction. So good for us. But then it does tend to blow in a northerly direction. So not too concerned. Try and... Keep you up, get a quick view and then move out just for the excitement 
and thrill of getting your view. It's probably in all likelihood not going to be the best view, but at least it gives you an idea of how to approach dangerous game. And importantly, our fundamental reason and goal when approaching dangerous game is not to let the animal know that we're here. And we're going to be able to do that quite well now. I've just seen it. We're going to have to try and be quiet and vehement. If you just look straight ahead of us, just over these branches here, everyone. It's not easy for VM though, because it's very thick in there, but you will be able to slowly now start working out that there's an elephant feeding. Very slowly there, you can start to see it. You can just see it moving. You can maybe see the odd little white flash of its tusks. There's its ears flapping. And because it's feeding towards us, and because the wind is not hugely in our favor, probably not going to stay here too much longer. Again, when the time is right, we'll get close, get great views on foot, but when it's not, it's definitely not worth taking the chance. So we can slowly just start backing up. It's literally just starting to walk out to us, and I want to sneak off without it even knowing that we were here. It will at some point probably smell us, but by then we'll be gone, we'll be in the vehicle, which is not too far away. So we're not going to push the boundaries, but we just thought we'd take you along for a little sneak peek of an early. Isn't it wonderful though that we can get in, get you a quick view without it even knowing that we're there. Good stuff, we're going to send you back to Brent's and we're going to head back to the vehicle. There we go, we're still here. It's quite cute, and little guys, most of them are sleeping at the moment, not too much action happening. Uh, we can chat a bit more about hyenas. So, the spotted hyena, Crocutta Crocutta's ancestors, dip, broke away from the hyena, larger hyena super group or subfamily uh, that holds the other two hyena species. I nearly gave it away there. And about 10 million years ago, and at one stage, they've had multiple migrations into Europe, as, reaching as far as France. Uh, during the about 360,000 years ago, but humans and other factors such as climate have forced them back down into Africa, spotted hyenas particularly. Of course, there's lots of theories to why hyenas are a female dominant society and one of the only ones out in the bush. And there's a couple of different ones, and one of them is that they needed to become bigger to compete with males at the kills to be able to provide enough milk for the cubs. And the other one, which runs sort of conspecifically conspe with, uh, with that one, is that the cubs take such a long time to develop those massive skulls and, and, and muscles around those jaws to enable them to effectively crush bones and that the females need to look after them for a lot longer and that's why the females have become bigger and more dominant. Just a mom is saying one and a half year old Missy is getting very excited at seeing the hyenas, but she thinks it's because you might think they're kitties. Well, they're more are quite a strange one in terms of evolution. They're neither cats nor dogs. Probably more closely related to mongoose than either. So Marianne in Arkansas is saying it looks like hyenas. She's just noticed that they lack defined whiskers. They do have whiskers. They are not nearly as prominent as in some of the other animals. And the main reason for this would probably be because of their feeding strategy. In the carcasses, those whiskers would be brushed and broken. And they do get deep 
stuck deep into quite rotting large carcasses. So you probably find that and you also find the hair on their face and on their neck is shorter and that's also uh, uh, from the way they feed. As we look there at a little cute hyena cub, Cindy in Florida is wondering how many cubs can a hyena have? Cindy, uh, generally I've heard of in freak occurrences in captivity of them giving birth to three or sometimes even four, but in the wild two is generally the maximum. And if they're both females, the one, the firstborn female will kill the other female. Hyenas are the ultimate survivors and opportunists. And Donna Miller is wondering whether they would feed on the carcass of another hyena or a baby hyena that has died. Uh, I've po very possibly done that. Hyenas will literally eat anything. Um, I have seen them eat carcasses of adult hyenas. I've never actually seen them eat the carcass of another cub. Uh, but it is, it is definitely possible. And that refusal to have a Catholic diet is one of the reasons they're so successful. all lovely and peaceful here at the hyena den. And Robin in Maryland is wondering, do the hyenas have rounded or slit pupils uh, like the big cats or like the small cats? And well, Robin, uh, hyenas have rounded. She's also wondering about serval and caracal. And to be completely honest, Robin, I'm not 100% sure. I know African wild cat has slit pupils, but with those medium-sized cats, I'm not 100% sure, so I'll have to actually look that up. Well done to Eric Gowen, who got the answer to which hyena species is found outside Africa. It is the striped hyena, and they occur from the edge of the Maasai steppe in Tanzania through into Asia uh, and through Iran and places like that as well, all the way to India and Pakistan. Most African cultures, hyenas have such a, a very bad reputation, but there are some, some African cultures where they are a deity. The Tabwa in East Africa, uh, from East Africa, uh, they portray it. The spotted hyena was actually a gift from the sun to come down and warm the cold earth. Isn't that nice? It's probably one of the only positives I've ever found uh, about, uh, in mythology about spotted hyenas. Normally they're considered to be brutish, lazy, sneaky and stupid, which they are of course none of the above.
Guys, it is getting quite dark now. And unfortunately, we can't brighten up the image too much. And we're not going to leave just yet. We'll sit here for a little bit longer with these wonderful creatures before leaving. We don't want to be here. And we don't use spotlights on cubs. Safari Dean is being a jokester. He says it's a female dominated species because it was a big female cat that made it with a little male wild dog. Julia in Houston is wondering why the hyenas have stayed at this den for so long when they've moved and why there's so many of them. Probably because it is such a large den, Julia. And also the drought is probably playing in a part that a lot of the parasites haven't bred. So the fleas and things like that might not be as common as they would be when we have lots of rain. So that's possibly another reason. So they're not being irritated by ectoparasites and therefore are able to stay at the den longer than they would have traditionally uh, because the den would have become infested. Now on our standards, you'll probably find that that den is still infested and if you had to walk there, your legs would be absolutely covered in fleas. May on YouTube is wondering are the bonds in hyena society close enough that if one dies they'll mourn like an elephant? Uh, not really. It's very much look after your own. There might be a little bit of mourning, but it's not mourning as such. Um, it's uh, basically not being able to cope with the hormonal change. It happens with lions and leopards as well. Uh, when they lose a cub, they often walk around calling for it for a few days. Uh, because they're still producing milk, so their body is telling them they should be feeding. And even I've even watched a leopard watch her cub get killed by lions and then still continued to walk around that day calling for three days. I've also seen a female leopard kill her own cub and then still call and walk around for three days. As with elephants mourning, I don't believe they mourn. Uh, I think they're curious. More than anything, if you're referring to the fact that they pick up bones wherever they go, I've seen them do the exact same thing with elephant bones and hippo bones and giraffe bones and kudu bones. And so I think it's more of a curiosity uh, than a mourning. And elephant, the elephant mourning, as I was describing now, is very similar to the cat mourning. Uh, the, the hormones in the female's body after she's lost a baby is telling her that she should still be having a baby and she will try to raise the dead baby but i don't know if it's mourning is such the same as human beings and i think it might be more of a, a hormonal reaction that's my my personal opinion i've been watching these animals for a long time and i know other people might disagree with me and you guys are more than welcome to think what you like but it is getting too dark now to be at the hyena den. We're gonna take one last question and then we'll move off. So Hilma in Holland, 
is wondering if it's also true if two male hyena are born, will they also uh, kill? Yes and no. Sometimes it will happen. I think it might. It just depends. Sometimes it doesn't happen. But uh, generally, uh, when you have two cubs from the same litter, uh, they will generally be a male and a female. Or they might call. No. I just heard the one female start and then went, boom, head flat. So we're going to leave the hyena den. It's too dark for us to be here much longer. So we're going to cross back to Scotty. And I'm sure he's just going to bid you adieu because it's getting too dark to walk as well. So as you can see, we've changed our mode of transport from shoes to a vehicle. And it was just getting a bit too dark and gloomy and we had kind of done a big loop back to the vehicle in order to find out what those noises were right at the end, which was that elephant you got to saw, to see rather. Well, what a wonderful afternoon it's been. Great to have you guys with us as always. And thanks Genevieve in New York for your feedback regarding your insect list that you're working on. And that is the beauty of being out on foot is that you get to explore some of the less known, the less well identified characters of the African wilderness. Poor old Viem, who's on camera with me today, has not seen a big cat since we've been on leave. So I'm hoping desperately we're gonna be able to find <laughs> we're gonna be able to find him one. Um, but the clock's ticking for this drive. This is a nasty tree called a buffalo thorn, but thankfully at the base here there are no thorns. And you'll see how hard it was for me to pull, not because it was heavy, but because all of the hooked thorns were getting caught on everything that they got dragged past over there. Just before you joined us, we also removed another Zizifus tree out of the middle of the road. So the elephants, and this is interesting because the, the Zizifus we moved earlier was alive and it had been snapped in order for the elephant to feed on some portions of that tree that weren't easy to access. Yet this is old, there's no leaves in it, but it's still on the road. So you ask yourself why? And that is because that dead buffalo thorn would have been providing a kind of nursery effect for small pioneer plants to pop up. It was protecting them, preventing other animals from feeding on them. A lot of the antelope that don't have the power and ability to pick something up and move it. And that is why that one was in the road. How's my hair looking, guys? Have I got hat head? Hard to tell either way. <clears throat> Sure, I gave my knee a nice wallop. It's actually bleeding, so you should all feel deeply sorry for me now. I may even stop and shed a tear. I'm just gonna shine my flashlight up into a hole in the tree here. Probably not gonna find anything. But this is an interesting hole. There's many animals that have lived in there. Let's just stop and have a closer look. I think I may have actually seen a gecko running around in there. It may have disappeared, but you guys are gonna to get to be able to zoom very close up into that cavity. And the reason why I find this cavity so interesting is I've seen multiple different birds living in here, as well as reptiles and as well as, yeah, just birds and reptiles. I haven't seen a squirrel in there, but we've seen woodlands kingfishers nesting in here, lilac breasted rollers nesting in there, a rock monitor sleeping in there, and as well as that gecko that I've just seen very briefly, but can't be certain if it is. There could be well camouflage here in there, but I just saw something squiggle away. Good. And 
We had an awesome, awesome sighting last summer when Woodlands kingfishers were nesting in there. And we were waiting patiently for the adults to return to watch them feed the chicks. And you wouldn't believe what one of the adults brought back. It brought back a snake. It wasn't a very big snake. Woodlands kingfishers aren't very big themselves. It was probably about six inches long. But one lucky chick had a serpentine meal that day. Annie in British Columbia, you would like to know how much the drought that we're expect, uh, experiencing has affected the bees and the amount of pollen that they're making. And I'm sure it's had a, a very large impact actually on the amount of pollen that and nectar that they've been able to collect in order to make their honey because the vegetation certainly hasn't been getting the help it's needed. So I don't think there's been as many flowers as normal, although maybe I'm wrong, maybe the flowers, um, there was enough kind of latent energy or nutrients or water around in early summer when a lot of the flowers do bloom to not have too much of an effect. But no, I, I, let me take that back. That must be having an effect on the amount of honey they have. And I guess for a lot of the animals that rely on anything vegetation related, like bees, like the herbivores, it is going to have effects on their lifestyle and how easy things are going for them at the moment. Oh wow, look at this. There's a hyena. I'm just going to try and creep up to it. it. Looks like a youngster, it's still very spotty. And it appears to have quite a long coat. Where should I stop? Maybe here's going to be a gap. Oh, perfect. I think that's going to work. How's that, Vim? Got a very black end to its tail as well. Very distinctive. Yay. Well, sorry, Vim. It's not a big cat, but it is kind of technically because they are more cat than dog, the hyena. So it's like a big mongoose, Vim says. <laughs> that was awesome. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that very large mongoose sighting we've just had. <laughs> Hello Susie Wolf, are you interested to know a little bit about uh, a more dog-like animal, the wild dog as opposed to the hyena, and whether their colorations and, and, and uh, looks will, will, will appear different in different parts of Africa and yes they, they, they will but only to a certain degree you'll never be able to confuse a wild dog with another animal they're very distinctive in terms of their shape of their body their anatomy their coloration does have quite interesting variations um, depending on where you go in Africa um, in the Aberdare mountains uh, where I've spent a little bit of time in Kenya I noticed that the wild dog were, were big up there they were considerably stockier and more bulky than the wild dog uh, th that I've seen elsewhere in Africa and they also had particularly dark coats um, there's other parts of Africa where some packs have got particularly light coats but I haven't spent enough time with enough different packs of wild dogs to be able to give you huge Huge insights into that, but there definitely are dif differences. Look at how cool this bird is in the road. You can just see its shadow. I'm just going to switch off the, the car and let VM take a zoom in there. This is going to be epic. And I'm going to just... VM, do you want more light? What you may be able to see if you look very... Ah... Oh. Off it goes, there's such, oh, you're back. Welcome back, thank you for coming. And what they do is they like to place themselves on roads because it usually means the, the clearest skyline above them will be on a road because there's nothing growing out obstructing the, their view. And as insects fly above them, they fly up and catch them on the wings. And I don't think I've even told you what kind of a bird this is yet. It's a nightjar. Which kind of nightjar? It's close to impossible to tell unless we were to catch it and open up its wings or if we were to hear it call. 
the fiery neck nightjar is one of the most common nightjars that we hear calling here, but they haven't been very vocal. They were vocal in early summer. <whistles> Good Lord deliver us is what their call rings out. Now, VM, I don't know if you can punch zoom onto its beak or if it's too risky or if the light is too low. Okay, you maxed out. But they, well, they have what are called rictal bristles, which are basically like a whisker that grow out from... Oh, I wonder if it caught a little insect there. Possibly. Anyway, um, what, what we have are these plants uh, called plants. They've got these uh, little uh, whiskers called rictal bristles that grow out in a forward direction like this, creating a bit of a funnel into their beak. They didn't have a big beak, as you can see there, but their mouth is huge. It can open into a massive, massive uh, cavity that insects can go into with the help of those bristles that help feed the insects into their mouth as they catch them on the wing. You would have also noticed they've got massive eyes. They're quite owl-like <clears throat> in appearance. And well done, Vim's multitasking. He's shining a torch, working the camera. Um, this is not one of our regular broadcasting vehicles, but it is great fun taking you guys on something that's a little bit different and changing the scenery is always pleasant and I guess that's exactly what this is it's just a little change of scenery for everyone involved come on Tingana let's find VM a big cat to film Tingana is a big male leopard for those of you who are new to the show and wondering what on earth Tingana may be he is the big dominant male leopard who we see here uh, more frequently than any other big males at this stage. He's slowly but surely shifted from Arethusa across onto, onto Juma in the year that I've been here. Now he basically takes up a whole area of traverse and even more than that. So he's the big male that we see. One thing that takes a bit of getting used to in this much bigger vehicle is that it's very, very long and a little bit more kind of, it requires a different driving technique to the short wheelbase vehicles that we have. And like I was saying this morning, a uh, problem that's often made by a lot of people on safari is that they think that the best seat on the vehicle is the back seat, which is not necessarily the case, especially if you've got a guide who drives quickly. <laughs> got very different conditions to us at the moment and you've got snow falling over there um, quite the opposite here we've got nothing falling out the sky sadly and you'd like to know when we can expect to see the leaves kind of changing falling off the tree for the autumn uh, into the winter and to be honest Pamela it's already started happening with a lot of the trees but that's abnormal it's happening abnormally early and that is thanks to the droughts there's a knobthorn acacia outside uh, Nikki and my room and in the one week that we were away now on leave it went from being full green not looking incredible but I mean all of its leaves were intact up in the tree one week later we've come back and the ground has just got a carpet a thick carpet of leaves almost as if it's just thrown in the towel it's given up it cannot go on any longer and I'm told that further north of here Steph was just mentioning a, a mentioning a little bit earlier that there's a Mapani belt Mapani woodland which we spoke a little bit of earlier with the Mapani bees that live in that area and surroundings but there's apparently 40 percent of those trees have not just lot, lost their leaves they have actually died um, so the drought is real but we must always remember that it's not necessarily a bad thing yes now it's not good for the trees that are dying the individuals the individual herbivores that may be suffering but for the greater good of this ecosystem it's kind of mother nature's way of doing a clean out you could you could look at it like that and by 
stopping and making sure that all the, the weakened uh, animals that have kind of maybe overtaken certain areas like trees that have kind of overgrown and become too old and too big now it's a clean slate starting again um, steps thankfully jumping out and attempting to pull out a branch that got stuck behind the car thanks Steph um, that we were essentially sweeping the road with Good luck with the snow. It's been many years since I've been in snow and quite looking forward to my next skiing trip. Who knows when that will be though. Anyway, um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful afternoon with all of you guys and thank you for joining in. Make sure to join in on the Sunrise Safari. Who knows what's going to be happening then. It will be James and myself out. I'm not sure who's going to be doing it, what yet, but I guess you just got to tune in to work that out when it happens. Um, VM, thank you very much for your work on camera. Steph, the mystic boer, as James call him, thanks very much for your help in keeping us safe, as well as finding Cindy that praying mantis within 30 seconds of her request. That was ridiculous. Um, and of course, to all of you guys, thanks for your questions, comments, contributions, and well done to Nikki, who's directing the show, and to Leanne, who's been lending her a hand. We are going to send you back to Brent for the last few minutes of the safari. So, I decided to come check one last gander at an incredible little carnival that we don't get to see too often. And I found the den while ago. It's too light for them to be out when we go there. So I'm going to come have a quick look now, just before the end of the safari. in the middle. Yep, here we go. Oh. Let's try it a little bit closer. everyone for joining us on tonight's sunset safari the bush baby has jumped off uh, unfortunately the lion seemed to have left uh, but great job to Scotty and Steph for tracking them for as far as they did and Scotty got to show you some incredible little creatures we don't often get to see from the vehicles but uh, from myself and Dave don't forget to join us on the sunrise safari and toodles for now